The skeleton frame is often thought of as primarily a structural advance. The, one of the things that defined uh, the way that we held skyscrapers up in the 19th century and that led to what we think of as the modern skyscraper. In this talk, I want to show that it was also really a material advance and that the skeleton frame emerged, at least in part, out of the change in the stuff that we actually have built tall buildings out of, especially the change from brick to iron, but also from iron to steel. That doesn't sound like a very big difference, but the varying properties of iron and steel actually had very important consequences, not only for how we hold buildings up, but how we keep them from uh, falling over, uh, how, how they resist wind. I want to focus on Chicago because there were particular things about Chicago that uh, made it uh, uniquely suited to the, the kind of geometry of the skeleton frame. And I also want to bring in a couple of what I think of as adjunct materials, uh, glass and terracotta in particular, that were key in developing the kind of architectural manifestation uh, of the skeleton frame. If you look at the height of skyscrapers in Chicago between the Great Fire uh, and World War II, you can see a couple of jumps where the, the typical height uh, of a high-rise commercial building uh, suddenly doubles or, or even triples. Some of this is due to the relaxation of codes, but codes, of course, only relax when there's something pushing them. So we can treat this as a sort of proxy for technical developments and look to see where these happened. We really see a couple of major jumps. Uh, the first a few years after the fire, the late 1870s, early 1880s, when a new kind of brick appeared that enabled for the first time uh, skyscrapers to take advantage of some of the uh, height possibilities that the passenger elevator promised. Uh, and then to me, what's really the most important period uh, from about 1890 through World War I, when uh, steel and some of the connections and uh, structural opportunities offered by that material that hadn't been uh, available to brick or concrete or uh, cast iron construction uh, took over. And then a much later period uh, that looks at uh, electric elevators uh, and pneumatic riveting uh, that leads to much taller uh, frames. I want to look at these first two periods uh, right after the Great Fire and then between about 1885 uh, and World War I as uh, really good illustrations of how new industrialized materials led to changes in building form in Chicago in particular. To do that, I think it's important to go back and look at the city's building stock uh, before the 1880s, uh, so post-fire, uh, late 1870s, what was Chicago building? There's a myth, very common myth, that the city rebuilt itself uh, in a kind of slightly more modern image after the fire, but the truth is that most landowners simply reconstructed what had been there uh, before, uh, before things uh, burned. Uh, on the left, you see what were really the most technically innovative structures in Chicago, uh, the grain elevators that, that uh, I spoke about in an earlier uh, uh, lecture. Um, and on the right, you see the much less technically innovative commercial buildings that were going up in the loop. This is where the traders who were betting on the prices of grain in the elevators did their business. They needed uh, places for their offices, they needed places to meet, and real estate became its own speculative commodity uh, in Chicago in particular because of the, the tight confines of, of the loop. So you see though that these are buildings that could have gone up in virtually any city in the United States, five to seven stories, uh, fairly small windows, stone and brick construction, um, architects or contractors sort of aping what they saw uh, in New York or in, or in pattern books, um, not terribly sophisticated and oddly enough, uh, often done uh, once again in that with timber flooring and things like that. Uh, another fire in 1874 was the first time that the city really began to think uh, about building ordinances that would uh, restrict the, the building materials used to something that was not as flammable uh, as wood. But all of these buildings, and in fact, all of Chicago's buildings uh, through about 1910, struggled not only with how to pile more floors on top of one another, uh, but also how to illuminate the spaces within. Uh, John Root, writing in 1890, 
uh, talks about the great architectural problem of the skyscraper, not necessarily as one of heights, but rather one of illumination. How do you organize the building? How do you frame the exterior walls so that you're bringing in enough light uh, to do business in? Uh, electric lighting was invented in the 1870s by Edison, but it was a luxury item. Uh, it began to show up in Chicago buildings in the 1880s, but was really only used at night. It was expensive. Uh, light bulbs burned out quickly, uh, and so during the day, offices had to be illuminated by windows. And here you see Root with a, a, a prototype uh, building plan, trying to wrap as many offices as he can around not only the building exterior, but the light court uh, in the center of the block, so that every office essentially has a, has a window. Now, how large those windows could be was often tied up with what materials the building was made out of. Brick, uh, being a relatively weak material compared with iron or steel, required much more volume to carry the loads of a, of a commercial building. And here you see a, a few Chicago buildings that really show the possibilities of this new kind of wonder material, cast iron, uh, first used for building facades in New York in the 1850s and exported uh, to Chicago by uh, cast iron manufacturers uh, in, in Manhattan. On the left, maybe the most famous cast iron facade left in Chicago, the Berghoff Restaurant, uh, where you can see the size of the windows in comparison with the buildings uh, just to the left of it. Uh, the cast iron, because it's much stronger than brick, uh, can hold, can carry the, the loads of a commercial building with a much smaller cross section. And builders, architects can use that savings in material to expand the windows uh, in a typical block. Um, on the right, maybe a, a, an even more uh, dramatic demonstration of this, uh, three brick facades from the 1880s post-fire uh, that were renovated, replaced, with cast iron supports on their ground stories, the, the retail or storefront uh, level. And you can see that the area of the brick piers on the upper stories uh, is drastically reduced by the strength of cast iron on the lower stories. Uh, this means that instead of the sort of small double hung windows, the retailers on the ground floor could have much more spacious shop windows not only bringing in more light, but in this case also uh, showing off more of the, the, um, the, the retail merchandise uh, to the street. So cast iron was uh, a very efficient material, but of course it proved to have uh, a lot of the same vulnerabilities to fire that the timber did. Uh, iron, of course, melts at high temperatures. Uh, and worse, it's uh, cast iron in particular is very brittle and uh, susceptible to thermal shocks. So when uh, a cast iron building is on fire and the fire department shows up and pours cold water onto red hot uh, cast iron columns, the columns is likely uh, are not going to just simply explode and the building is going to come down uh, around them. And cast iron, as you can see on the left, uh, was uh, no more successful in resisting the Chicago fire uh, than timber. You can see the wreckage of a, of a cast iron building uh, in front. So because of this experience, Chicago uh, had a little bit of a, a natural skepticism uh, toward cast iron. And for uh, a decade or so after the fire, uh, tended to build as much in brick or anything else. And in fact, with the export of brick technology from Philadelphia, which had been uh, America's uh, sort of primary brick uh, innovation center, uh, Chicago became, in the late 1870s, early 1880s, really a, a city of masonry. Uh, the city was built of itself, uh, one engineer said, because it's built on a, a huge uh, layer of clay, uh, but between the slow-moving river and the, the lake, uh, Chicago had an endless supply of material with which to make bricks. And when uh, hydraulic pressed brick technology came online in the 1870s, Chicago was one of the first cities to adopt it wholesale. Uh, brick manufacturers purchased equipment from Philadelphia uh, and began making hydraulically pressed brick, in which the water is squeezed out of the clay before firing, uh, gaining uh, up to two or three times the bearing strength uh, of conventional fired brick. And this accounts, I think, in large part for this first jump in height. Uh, when pressed brick begins to be used in Chicago, 
uh, the first maybe industrialized building material that, that the city sees. Um, you see this uh, jump in height from those five or six story buildings up to nine, 10, uh, even 11 stories uh, in, the, in the 1880s. Um, the passenger elevator, remember, has been around for uh, a, a decade or more by this point, and it's really the structure, I think, in this case, catching up to the conveying technology that, that allows this jump in height. The first 10-story building in Chicago, or 11 stories, depending on how you count it, uh, was the Montauk Block, uh, one of the first projects designed by a young Daniel Burnham and John Root in 1882. If you look at the plan and the elevation, you can see very clearly that this is a, very much a brick structure. It has all of four cast iron columns in it, uh, but most of the structure, both in terms of the gravity load, the bearing load, and the wind bracing, in other words, the, the shear walls that are keeping the building from racking or overturning uh, from wind forces, all of these are handled by uh, pressed brick. It's a new height uh, that's achievable with the new material, uh, but you can see that even pressed brick uh, has the problem of kind of fighting for space on the building facades with the windows. And you can imagine a root here trying to make the windows as large as possible to open up daylight for the offices within, uh, but really being constrained by the need to provide adequate cross-section for all of these brick uh, piers, essentially. And you can think of this either as a network of brick piers uh, or as a wall with windows punched into it. This really becomes one of the key distinctions between New York and Chicago skyscraper architecture. How do we think about uh, the way or the, the system uh, that we use uh, to, to put brick to the task of holding the, the buildings up. Why do the cities think differently about this? Well, I think it has to do with the soil that Chicago sits on. That same wet clay that's very good for making bricks is very bad for holding up heavy buildings. And in fact, the wet clay that uh, exists for about 80 feet under Chicago's loop uh, gets referred to by a skeptical New York press as the Great Jelly Cake, uh, which in 1891 uh, suggests that all of these new skyscrapers in Chicago uh, are gradually sinking into the muck and mire that is below the, the, the loop. Chicago architects have to develop ways of uh, coping with this soil. In cities out east, where there's a relatively uh, high stratum of bedrock, under lower Manhattan, for instance, or Boston, the typical way to construct a skyscraper is simply to scrape off the soil uh, until you get to bedrock, build what's called a spread footing, basically a, a, a little bit of a, of a foot for uh, your skyscraper walls, and then to simply build uh, your walls on top of that. If you have a much deeper uh, stratum of bedrock, however, and no good way to reach it, um, what you have to think about is how to actually literally float your building uh, on the, the clay soil below, essentially taking your building and putting it onto a series of what I think of as lily pad foundations. So there are two ways that Chicago engineers do this. Um, one is called a pyramidal footing. Uh, this is used through about 1882. These are giant pyramids of stone that go under each column uh, and that spread out until the engineers guess that they have enough bearing area under that uh, footing to literally float the building. And very early on, engineers realized that uh, to calculate this, you actually have to distill the weight of the building down onto individual columns. Uh, walls are what we call hyperstatic. It's not really possible to understand uh, how loads are going to flow from columns into walls underground uh, without advanced math that, that we have today. And so engineers are told basically, take your building, think of it as a series of columns, each column uh, gets uh, calculated for the amount of floor area that it's carrying, and then that column requires a certain bearing area uh, under the ground. Pyramidal footings are used to about 1882. Uh, it's with uh, the Montauk, among others, that uh, engineers realize they can use uh, railroad steel or iron to make what are called grillage footings, which are almost literally like lily pads. Uh, they, they spread the weight out in a, in a flat grill of iron uh, rails or beams, uh, and this opens up the, the basement uh, 
uh, quite a bit. It's not until the 1890s uh, Dankmar Adler adopts techniques from bridge construction to put skyscrapers on top of caissons. But for this period between the, the sort of uh, 1870s when we're beginning to build taller buildings but still out of heavy brick, and 1894 when Adler figures out ways to get down to the bedrock that's underneath Chicago soil, that Chicago engineers really have to think about their buildings, uh, not in terms of walls, but as a network of columns or piers. Um, here in the auditorium building, uh, this is a, 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 a pyramidal footing uh, made with limestone uh, underneath the, the, uh, the, the auditorium's uh, tower. Um, the auditorium was one of the most famous demonstrations of this principle. Uh, Dankmar Adler and Louis Sullivan were the uh, architects engineers. And uh, in calculating the tower, Adler uh, did the job exactly right. Uh, after the foundations were poured, the auditorium came back and asked for an additional two stories on the tower, which served as the, the water tank for the, the hydraulics for the stage. Um, Adler told them that the additional weight would compress the clay soil further, that the tower would actually sink. Uh, they insisted. They built the extra two stories. The tower, in fact, sank. And today, when you walk into the lobby of the auditorium, you walk down about two or three feet uh, from the street. Adler and Sullivan ultimately opened their office in the tower, so the story uh, maybe has a happy ending. Um, but you can see these massive pyramids uh, underground, and the, the Adler beginning to think very clearly about uh, how you put uh, a large building on top of that, what you have to think about in terms of the way the structure above comes down and sits uh, on those big pyramids. So my own sort of pet theory about this is that if you are a New York architect or engineer and you can simply take your walls down to bedrock and put a, a little spread footing under them, that you tend to think of the building itself as a network of walls into which you can punch windows wherever you want, between which you can fill them with uh, the beams that, that carry the floors. But essentially, if you have good soil, bedrock, uh, it's natural to continue to think of the building as a, as a system of walls. If, on the other hand, you are trying to perch your building on these isolated pyramids, uh, it's more natural to think of the building as a network first uh, of brick piers that you might uh, connect with girders and, and, uh, and beams of the same iron. But now, instead of the wall, you're starting with a, a void. And the way you might think of that wall instead is as, a, is as like narrow spandrels that take only enough space to cover and fireproof uh, the, the girders and beams and to keep people literally from falling out of the building. You're left with uh, these big voids that you can fill in with glass to bring in the light that, that Root has said we need to illuminate uh, office interiors. This, I think, gets kind of uh, pushed even further when uh, iron and steel come into the mix and you begin thinking of the building less even as the series appears and literally more as a, a metal skeleton. And those voids, I think, become a way of thinking about the building more so than they do if you're thinking about the structure on the basis of those walls springing up from uh, the spread foundations instead of the isolated piers. The evidence for this is circumstantial, but if you look, for instance, at the early uh, 1880s work of Adler and Sullivan, I think you can imagine these isolated piers, these uh, pyramidal foundations and later grillage foundations, really emerging above the ground, not as a system of walls, but as a system of piers that get infilled by larger and larger windows. So here, the jeweler's building, uh, an early Adler and Sullivan uh, design. You can see the brick piers coming up from the foundation, uh, the lintels and spandrels being made of a mix, limestone and cast iron. And Sullivan, I think, realizing that there's an opportunity here to expand the windows uh, to fill those voids, right? To, to start with a default of openness and transparency instead of the default of a solid wall. William LeBaron Jenny does this in 1879, the lighter store, the first uh, commission that he uh, does for uh, Chicago merchant Levy Lighter, where famously there are these brick piers that are backed up by cast iron. Cast iron is carrying the interior uh, loads. The brick is carrying the load of the exterior wall. But both of those elements sit on the same isolated foundations. And Jenny here, 
very early on is thinking about the building as a frame instead of as a system of walls and famously uh, filling the voids of that frame with as much glass uh, as he can. The very, very low spandrels in this were, were famous in Chicago of people feeling like they were going to, to literally fall out of the building. Now, a few years later, when Jenny is building the seven or eight story, later 10 story home insurance building, He's still thinking along this line, uh, but he's using cast iron and brick in a different way. Now, this building very often gets thought of as the first skeleton frame, and I think it's much more just an advance on earlier ideas about using brick and iron together to create building frames that not only stand up against gravity, but also resist falling over, right? Getting pushed over by, by wind. Um, here in this uh, reconstruction, you can see the, the blue is all cast iron, uh, the green is all wrought iron, and the red obviously is brick. And if we look at this detail in particular, you can see that the home insurance is really a, a hybrid. Now the, the, the cast iron column has literally moved inside the brick pier. And when Jenny writes about the home insurance, the title that he gives his article uh, in The Sanitary Engineer in 1885 is A Tall Building on Compressible Soil. Only incidentally does he mention the, the iron in the building, what later gets called the first skeleton frame. And Jenny describes it literally as a reinforced brick pier. He uses cast iron in the brick to make the brick stronger, to reduce the amount of brick that he needs to, to carry the loads. The brick, of course, adds fire protection to the cast iron. Cast iron adds strength to the brick. So there's this structural hybrid, uh, and the home insurance really is one of several transitional buildings where you see the iron frame on the inside. On the outside, you have this combination, this reinforced brick pier structure definitely tending toward a skeleton, right? Uh, bringing the idea of those uh, isolated foundations up above the ground, but still very much a hybrid, using the hand-placed masonry around the industrially produced cast iron uh, as a structural and as a fire protection hybrid. Now, the next step though is to move beyond the limitations of, of cast iron. One of the most important things to understand about these early uh, structures is the difference between the iron that they used for their structure and the steel that we use today. Uh, cast and wrought iron were produced in two very different ways and had two very different sets of properties. Uh, cast iron was made by simply taking iron ore, uh, melting it and pouring it into molds. It has a very, very high carbon content, which gives it a very high compressive strength, but makes it very, very brittle, impossible to work once it comes out of the molds. It's also very unreliable in tension. The casting process is a violent one. Uh, cast iron entrains all kinds of air bubbles. You never quite know how much cast iron you actually have and how much air you actually have. Uh, and cast iron was susceptible to actually just snapping under tension because of these entrained uh, air bubbles. So the brittle uh, nature of it was in some ways a bigger problem though because as the cast iron cooled, it shrank. Cast iron columns would twist and any connection that you wanted to make to the cast iron had to be cast into the actual piece. It couldn't be cut or drilled after because the, the brittle material would just shatter. So any uh, hole, any lug had to be oversized because during the cooling process, you were never quite sure where that was going to end up. Wrought iron, on the other hand, was sort of the high-tech material of the day. Um, it was made by a blooming and puddling where uh, molten iron would sit in a, what's, what was called a puddling furnace and laborers would literally scoop out the carbon deposits from the molten iron. Uh, dangerous work, very, very slow, very expensive process, but one that produced a material that was ductile because of the low carbon content, um, had a much lower compressive strength, also because of the lower co carbon content, but because it was rolled instead of cast, uh, it had legitimate tensile strength. It was reliable in both compression uh, and tension. Ductile, meaning that you could drill it or cut it afterwards in very precise ways, but incredibly expensive and limited in large part to bridge construction where the need for a material in tension or bending uh, was really paramount. 
Here's a little spoiler alert down here at the bottom. Uh, but for the moment, let's look at what cast and wrought iron connections look like. Here is the home insurance's uh, exterior detail. Uh, and here a salvaged a piece of it that is actually in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. The column you can see is cast iron. It has these very characteristic uh, thick elements, uh, no holes drilled into them, nothing cut into them, everything just as it is when it came out of the mold. Here you can see the much more expensive, much more high-tech uh, wrought iron with the thin uh, plates that are characteristic of the rolling process, uh, drilled elements so that this pin is going through a very precise hole in the wrought iron and it's connecting usually to an oversized lug in the cast iron. Now, this is a strong connection in gravity because cast iron is so good in compression, but it has no rigidity to it. That single pin is going to do nothing when a wind force or any other lateral force uh, tries to rack the building, right? Tries to rotate the girders with respect to the, to the column. So the brick in the home insurance's exterior wall is there not only for fire protection, but Jenny was also relying on it for wind bracing. It's a way of solidifying the joint, of making it into a monolithic uh, moment resisting joint. The brick is not only the fireproofing, it's also the lateral resisting system uh, for, the, for the, the building frame. Other examples of this uh, right across the street from the home insurance, the Rookery building uh, by Burnham and Root, where you can see their reliance on cast iron for the interior structure around the light court and around the, the kind of donut corridor. And Burnham and Root used pure brick on the exterior of the Rookery where it would do the most good in terms of wind resistance. You can see that Root has distilled the brick of the rookery into these piers, each of which comes up from uh, one of these grillage footings underground. He's dressed them up with uh, some Romanesque arches, uh, as was the style at the time, but the rookery is very much a, a network of brick piers uh, and lintels except on that interior light court where unencumbered by any desire to uh, to match uh, a, a sort of architectural style um, root actually designs what some think of as the first or an early curtain wall where the vertical uh, cast iron columns are clad by terracotta the spandrels are as low as they can possibly be, and the windows between them take advantage of the thin proportions of the cast iron on the inside by opening up, right? These are uh, as large uh, windows as the structure will allow. And that brings uh, the maximum amount of daylight into these interior offices organized around the, the light court. Now, a few years later, a young upstart firm called Holliburton Roche realized that you can take this principle of iron structure that carries the gravity load, masonry structure that handles the, the wind load, and you can turn the masonry perpendicular to the exterior walls, opening up the exterior to the, the maximum amount of glass uh, you can possibly get. Here is the Tacoma building, a building that the Tribune describes as a massive kind of fragile pile of glass that they're sure is gonna fall into the street dur during the first windstorm. The reason they think that is that they can't see the wind bracing. The wind bracing is now internal. It's these four very, very heavy shear walls that are turned inside, right, perpendicular uh, to, to the exterior walls. That opens up the exterior, clearly, to plenty of glass, but it still, of course, takes up valuable rental space and carves the building into these smaller zones that eventually became difficult to rent. The Tacoma was demolished in the 1940s, uh, because it was no longer possible to meet the demands of commercial uh, real estate tenants who wanted bigger, more open floors. Now, the solution to this, the, the elimination of those massive shear walls, um, comes with the affordability of steel in the late 1880s, early 1890s. Uh, the Bessemer process, which uh, uses oxygen or fresh air to blast all of the carbon out of molten iron ore uh, and then comes back and adds in very careful uh, amounts of charcoal to bring that carbon content uh, up to a sort of magic number. And the open hearth process, a similar process that's more adopted in Chicago, uh, allows for the creation of this kind of magic material. We take steel for granted today, but the very, very tight control on the carbon content 
uh, hits this real sweet spot where steel gets a good portion of the compressive strength of cast iron, uh, more tensile strength than wrought iron, and it shares with wrought iron the important characteristic that it is ductile. It can be rolled at a relatively low temperature. It can be drilled, cut very precisely. And what this means is not only a material that is good for columns and for beams and girders, it also makes a material that allows engineers to create much stiffer, more reliable joints between girders, columns, and secondary systems of wind bracing. William LeBaron Jenny talks about the next generation of buildings as being quote unquote built like bridges. In other words, taking the techniques that railway engineers had used in wrought iron to build bridges for the rail network uh, out west uh, and basically turning them on their ends. Instead of going from point to point, uh, building engineers start thinking of skyscrapers as giant cantilevers, right, sticking out of the ground. And they take cross bracing from bridge design, uh, knee bracing from naval architecture and portal framing, and they turn these into ways uh, that the steel frames themselves can resist not only gravity loads, but also lateral loads. If you look at typical cast iron details and compare them to typical steel details, you can just see intuitively the kind of uh, sort of clumsy, um, uh, very, very loose kind of rickety detailing that you get with cast iron versus the very, very solid riveted connections that you can get by uh, drilling and cutting steel and then hammering hot rivets into them uh, on, the, on the job site. Hammering rivets into cast iron, of course, would mean that the brittle material would shatter. Steel being ductile can, can handle that sort of uh, load uh, on site. And so here you see riveted connections that create these bridge-like wind bracing techniques uh, for, uh, for skyscrapers. Here on the right, you see a couple of early wind bracing details in Chicago uh, in the 1890s. Steel, an industrially produced material, riveting a process borrowed from industry being applied uh, on, the, on the job site. And as steel comes into the market uh, at, a, at a more affordable level, you see uh, this big jump, almost doubling the height of typical skyscrapers in Chicago right away, right around 1890. Uh, this jump, I think, is entirely attributable to the fact that engineers, builders can now rely on much more refined, more precise, much, much smaller elements uh, to resist the wind loads. And they are thus safe going up beyond that sort of eight or nine stories uh, that they're used to with, with brick. Now, this doesn't take place right away. And there are also interesting transitional buildings that show the changeover from masonry wind bracing to steel wind bracing. To me, the most uh, interesting of these is the Monadnock, which we always think of as the tallest masonry skyscraper in the world. Um, if you look closely at the details, though, the Monadnock uses both brick and steel to support itself uh, against gravity and against wind. You can see here in the northern end a couple of steel columns, those famous bay windows where the brick sort of ripples uh, over the, 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 these bays. Those are actually supported on steel cantilever beams only possible in steel or you know, possibly wrought iron, only affordable in steel. And you can see that the Monadnock really is a, a hybrid system, brick piers, steel columns, steel beams. And if you look at the wind bracing, there are these giant shear walls, just like in the Tacoma, but there are also portal frames, right? These wind trusses that stiffen the northern end of the building uh, and prevent Burnham and Root from having to take up more valuable area with these thick, heavy masonry uh, wind walls. Now, right across the street, uh, some more advanced techniques uh, here at Holliburton Roche, uh, abandoning the shear walls of the Tacoma, replacing them instead with giant portal frames uh, made of steel. And further north, Burnham and Root, uh, with a, a slightly more aggressive client, uh, handling the wind forces in the Masonic Temple, which was claimed to be the tallest building in the world for about three weeks in 1892. You can see they have literally taken uh, the, the, the cross bracing that you would see in a railway truss bridge and used it for uh, basically a wind cantilever. Uh, and these trusses 
uh, stayed the Masonic temple in its, in its short direction. Now, steel is one of several industrial uh, materials that go into the kind of uh, evolution of the skyscraper at this point. The Masonic temple is still a very, very solid building uh, on the outside. And one sort of question is, well, how do we get from there to what we think of as the kind of curtain wall buildings of, of, of the modern era? And there is for a brief moment, this kind of flourishing of the glass curtain wall in Chicago that takes advantage of another industrial uh, material, plate glass. Plate glass uh, had been an enormously expensive material through the 1870s and 1880s, uh, largely sort of handcrafted. It's the development of uh, furnaces that rely on natural gas and powered grinding and polishing equipment that begin to make glass, take it from an artisanal material uh, into an industrial one. Um, here you see the difference between plate glass in the 1890s and just a few years later uh, in 1901. The handcraft that you see on the left versus the mechanization that you see on the right uh, happens in stages. And some of this actually happens in the 1880s, where you see the price of plate glass in the United States dropping as natural gas gets used, as steam power gets used for the, for the grinding. Um, you can see, too, that the price of electricity in Chicago stays high through the 1880s and 1890s. And over time, the uh, affordability of plate glass leads to these bigger and bigger windows in Chicago buildings. Chicago, though, has one quirk that makes it a much more hospitable place for plate glass to flourish in skyscraper construction than, say, uh, New York or Boston. And that is that in the late 1880s, a huge reservoir of natural gas is discovered under Ohio and Indiana. And, uh, Entrepreneurs from Pittsburgh, where the plate glass industry has been located, uh, move out west and begin building factories first in Findlay. And then two entrepreneurs realize that the northwest corner of the gas reservoir is less than two hours from Chicago by direct rail. And they open up factories in Kokomo and Elwood. The Kokomo factory is the largest in the world when it opens in 1890. Elwood uh, becomes the largest in the world when it opens in 1892. And diamond plate glass services the Chicago market exclusively. Uh, their uh, knowledge about plate glass is great. Their timing is really poor. The United States enters a huge depression in 1893. And diamond plate, which has churned out product, uh, assuming that the, the hot Chicago real estate market is going to continue, uh, has all of this glass uh, and essentially no market for it. This is the era of the great glass curtain wall buildings. And as a, a, a draftsman for uh, William Boyington, a Chicago architect, tells the Tribune, in the mid-1890s, uh, plate glass is quote-unquote cheaper than bricks. And it becomes not only the most efficient way to bring daylight into buildings, it becomes one of the cheapest ways to clad uh, tall buildings, uh, particularly in Chicago, which has access to this uh, incredibly inexpensive uh, plate glass just down the road. The Reliance Building is maybe the best known example of this. Um, you can see here it's about two-thirds glass on the outside, windows that are six feet by eight feet in some cases, uh, of single glazed uh, polished plate. And the Reliance also is the first uh, tall building uh, in Chicago to use moment connections where uh, uh, E.C. Shankland, Burnham's engineer, realizes that by oversizing the girders, oversizing the columns, and creating very, very stiff, riveted connections between the two, uh, he can rely on what he calls the table leg principle to spread wind forces, not through a system of cross bracing, but instead through the system of connections throughout the, the building frame. Um, these moment frames eliminate uh, even the, the kind of interference that cross bracing or, or portal frames provide in the building section. And of course, make the, the steel frame self-braced, right? No need for uh, uh, brick walls at all. Um, the Reliance also uses uh, a new development in industrialized terracotta that enamels it, protecting it from uh, wind and weather. And the industrially uh, manufactured terracotta panels take over from brick, both for fireproofing uh, and for uh, a, a building cladding. The Reliance uses some backup brick in uh, its uh, spandrel panels, 
and in its two curtain walls that serve as fire protection uh, from its neighbors. But the Fisher Building, its kind of sister building completed by the same designers in 1896, uh, because of a, a real estate quirk, they purchase essentially the air rights from their neighbor and need only uh, erect a, a very skinny a terracotta a temporary wall that's eventually removed when, when the Fisher Building expands in 1907. Um, the Fisher Building gets praised by Inland Architect as uh, the first building, tall building without walls. And what they mean is that it's built entirely without brick. Uh, the Fisher thus stands, I think, as an early example, maybe the first example, of the truly industrially produced skyscraper. Uh, there is no handicraft in the building structure. There's no handicraft in the building enclosure. The, uh, the artisanal process of laying bricks, the reliance on expensive uh, craft-based trade disappears here. All of the building structure is industrially produced steel. All of the cladding is industrially produced glass and terracotta. And the fissure thus makes an impact certainly on inland architect uh, as something new, right? A, a building that uses new processes and really to, to new results, right? A, a curtain wall that is as glassy uh, as, as the Reliance. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the craft being labor-based, uh, what we see even before the fissure is done is the brick industry and particularly the brick layers themselves uh, realizing that their livelihood is at stake. And even in 1893, uh, the bricklayers and brick manufacturers uh, lobbies Chicago aldermen to change the building code. They claim that terracotta is not an effective fireproofing material, which of course it is, um, but they managed to get Chicago to essentially legislate out all of the advantages of, of the skinny terracotta fireproofing and to require sizes of terracotta that at eight inches and 12 inches uh, are exactly the size of American common brick. They essentially legislate themselves uh, back onto the job sites. And you can see the results of this in buildings permitted under this code. The, the Fisher and Reliance are permitted before the code takes effect. The Stock Exchange is one of the first buildings to be permitted under the new code. And you can see Sullivan trying for the same bay windows that the Reliance and Fisher were known for, but being limited both by the size of the bay windows and the dimensions of the fireproofing that needs to go around its framing and instead beginning to develop another approach where the what, what's now known as the Chicago window, a fixed plate in the middle, double hung uh, windows on either side, basically push against the required dimensions of, of brick fireproofing now uh, wrapping the columns. This is the same formula uh, that Louis Sullivan uses for the Schlesinger and Meyer, later Carson Perry Scott store, a building that uh, sort of negotiates between the efficiencies of industrialized production, uh, iron uh, skeleton, some cast iron because uh, the steel industry was still having trouble keeping up with demand, uh, industrially produced plate glass, industrially produced terracotta, uh, but wrapped around hand laid bricks that, that fire protect the, the, the columns. The steel skeleton is thus uh, not only a great structural advance uh, and a great architectural advance, but also a great constructional advance. And it shows as much as anything, uh, not only the loftiness and lightness of construction, right? A, a big change in the way that we think about tall buildings, uh, but it also reflects changes in the way that we actually achieve those, both in the ways that we produce the materials that go into these buildings and the way that they're actually handled uh, on the job site. As such a building like the Fisher, uh, even though it, it's never really received recognition because architecturally it seems only a modest change maybe from the, from the buildings that came before, a little bit lighter, a little bit more open, uh, still decorated in, in ways that must have felt to, to modern historians, especially to be old fashioned. The Fisher represents a real change, mostly in the way that the building material is uh, fabricated, procured, uh, and assembled on site. And that I would argue is as important a change as any of the stylistic or architectural changes that we see uh, in skyscrapers of the same era.